What manner of man are you that can summon up fire without flint or tinder? I am an enchanter. <laughs> Have you ever thought to clean out your wizard's hamster cage with prestidigitation? Or how about marking the back of your barbarian's head with a symbol for kick me? If not, why? Magic isn't just about fireball and invisibility. Today we're talking spells, looking at casting from a different angle, and then we take a side trip into our thoughts on how magic systems can be improved. Grab your robe and let the dog out. It's time for some magic on Roleplay Geeks. Jim here for a quick announcement. The contest for the dice, spell cards, and t-shirt is over. We picked a winner, but we didn't get a response. And as per the contest rules, we need to pick another winner. And so, the new winner is... Drum roll, please. Andrew J. Matheny. Check your email for details so we can send this out to you ASAP. You will be receiving a request for a shipping address and for your t-shirt size. And now, back to the show. Hello, welcome to Roleplay Geeks. This is Frank. This is your token hippie, John. This is Jim. This is... Jeez. <laughs> Why? Every time. Every... <laughs> this is Steve. And this is Steve-O, a.k.a. The Other Steve. And today we're going to talk a little bit about something that uh, has been, uh, I think... A thorn in our sides? Well, a dimension Uh of (laughs) role-playing, fantasy role-playing, that that doesn't get enough vocalness. I don't think people talk about it enough or really deal with it a a lot, which is creative spellcasting. Now, when it comes to fantasy, probably that's the most definitive, defining thing of a fantasy system as opposed to, you know more science fiction based system is it's it's focus on magic yeah magic (laughs) and all that entails and it really allows an opportunity for players who do spell casting to engage their creativity a little bit right so the way it's if you think about spells like this is that in in a game you're presented with a series of obstacles or or puzzles or situations that you have to react in some form or fashion and spells actually become another series of tools as it were and it allows you to sort of think about how do i apply these tools in interesting and creative ways but arguably the original sort of fantasy system dungeons and dragons never really was set out to allow you to be that creative in your spell casting. Yet, as we've mentioned many times in the past, and we'll probably mention in the future, Steven is well known for trying to... Derail everything? I mean, well, do something a bit out of the ordinary. Chain events or, or chain spells or, or say, well, could I take this and alter it that way? Right. So today we're going to talk a little bit about creative spell casting and how you can kind of do that and what systems allow you to do that and how do you deal with that as a player and how do you deal with that as a GM. I just want to point out first that it's not just spells. He uses even ordinary everyday items in bizarre weird ways. <laughs> like a wet towel as a uh, wet towel weapon. in our last campaign. Yeah. So Don't know what to do with Don't the Don't forget to bring a towel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the wet blanket of the party. <laughs> So let's talk about Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, so the way that has is it gives a, an exhaustive list of the things you can do, right? So you have a light spell, you have a heal spell, you have a actually in, you have cure light wounds, cure medium wounds and heavy wounds. I don't know where we're at with fifth edition of that. You've got fireball, you've got lightning bolts, very specific things, and they have very definitive descriptions and effects. Vancy and magic, right? Right. <coughs> And so the idea is that you kind of take these things that you know, I kind of think of them like Legos that are immutable and figure out how you can put them together in interesting ways. Well, I mean, there's the, there's the one aspect where you have just the spells as they are. And then there's the kind of concept of, do you allow a player to 
somewhat modified the spell. Like if you're talking about like a wall of fire, could you do it as a circle of fire or a column of fire or... You just can't let that one go, can you? You just have to keep bringing it up. That's fine. I'm just, I'm pointing out, I'm, I'm, that just was Well, it's a very mind. good example, actually. I, it is, it's valid. So, uh, I'm just pointing out. There's trauma there. <laughs> it's not trauma. It, it, it actually, to me, is very defining about how I think about magic and spell casting and everything now. That was a, a, a big deal in terms of being a GM and trying to, well, you know, D&D rules don't really say it says it's, you know, like a 20 foot, you know, wall, eight feet high. I don't remember the exact details, but you know, it's, it's very defined exactly how big it is. And that's it. There's no, you know, mutable kind of details on dimensions or how you can change it or if you can change the color even. I mean, there's, there's any number of things that feasibly a player, a very difficult player might want to try and. <laughs> Might want to try and do, and it and it makes sense though. There's there's any number of situations you go well. Okay, I can see that that makes a lot of sense, and you'd want to maybe do that later on. But D and D doesn't really specifically have rules in place to handle that. So there's I guess you can get down to the fact to go okay. Well, the volume of this wall of flame is so much. So if you want to change the dimensions to this, you can do that as long as it doesn't, you know, exceed this or whatever, alter the dimensions beyond what the original spell is. Or you could even say, well, you could, yeah, you can, you know, fudge it a little bit and, and go a little bit bigger. And then you have the other aspect of where you maybe even string spells together or do something for completely unintended purposes with it. So there's a lot of differences to go with on, on producing, you know, spells and allowing characters to kind of play it, you know, with their full imagination uh, brought to the fore on that. So, Stephen, um, as we've obviously identified, you were early on in saying, how can I, how can I approach this in a different way? How can I evolve this in a way that that sort of extends the literal word a bit? But I think you've probably played D and D more editions of D and D certainly than any of us, and I would presume that having played with a lot of different GMs, there's been a varied response to your tendency to do that. So, <laughs> to what degree has the the constraint of the rules forced you to think about it? Like, how do I put these Legos together in a different order when you spell cast? Mm, that's an interesting question. To answer part of that, I know that uh, Jimmy and I talked about difficult difficult situations when you let people be creative or go outside the rules. And over the years, people have responded in various different ways to my wanting to use things in non-standard capacities. As a game master... You've got to be careful because if you allow a player to do something that is very much outside of the scope of the rules themselves, and you let that happen once, then you've opened a door for further, some might say, creativity, some might say abuse. You always wondered, like, how many times have you been stabbed by GM, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just wondered. So. Now, well, you, you remember, I've had quite a few DMs who have wished that I played something without access to spells. But I can't play a fighter. I, I can't. I can't play a fighter. I can't play a barbarian. I have a hard time playing a thief. I need that extra little bit of something to fall back on. So, within the scope of the rules... You can do something simple, like most people have played a magic user for a long time, and especially you know now with light being a cantrip, you can, and it lasts an hour, beginning of your journey, beginning of anything, you go in, in a cave, you grab up a couple of pebbles, you cast light, and you stick them in a pouch. 
And that way, for the next hour, you're walking in a cave and you need light, you throw down a rock. You leave a trail of these, you know, little lit rocks. Throw one into a room to illuminate it so you can see what's ahead of you. Things like that. Those kinds of things are easy to do within the context of the game. Conversely, when you have access to darkness, doing the same thing, casting darkness on a pebble, sticking it in your pouch, going in somewhere, everything hits the fan, drop one of those, use it like squid ink, excuse yourself from the room. So those, those are easy to, you know, say, yeah, you can do that. Now, being a higher level and saying, I want to polymorph that portion of that small cloud up there into an anvil, and I want it to fall on that guy's head, that gets a little more complicated. If you can do it based on distance and volume and trajectory and all that stuff, then you can make an argument for it to be allowed. But you start using things a little bit differently, like I'm going to cast Destroy Water on the aqueous humor in that guy's eyes. There's some action that the DM has to take in that particular case to see if that particular use of the spell is going far too far outside of its intention. Uh, someone had mentioned in a Reddit thread about using grease and then introducing the people in the village to deep frying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a really funny thread. And I was like, oh, because I saw Grease. I was like, yes, Grease. People are using Grease. And then there's <laughs> the guy with a little bit more rules lawyering in him. And he's like, well, you know, Grease just coats a surface. So you can introduce them to pan frying, but not deep frying. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's that's pretty oh, fantastic. <laughs> right, right. And then this other guy was like, well, if you can only cut a surface, does that mean that I have to lay the chickens on the ground and then cast grease? <laughs> and then this other guy's like, well, what if you had a frying pan big enough to stand in? And so- It sounds like a bunch of guys like you, man. I feel a little bit of solidarity in there. <laughs> yeah. A little bit. A little bit um, yeah, your I, I, I need to pay attention to their names so I can look for them. That's your people. That, that's my people. It's some of the Far Tooth <laughs> clan. <laughs> oh! <laughs> a little bit of a callback. We're spread far and wide. Yeah. It's true. So let, let me bounce this a bit over to Jimmy because he's the other person that tends to play magic users in some form or fashion that I play with. How do you approach the creativity and spell casting or do you much he doesn't i'm actually moving closer to mara i've been inspired by by mara's <laughs> uh spell casting <laughs> creativity so um what i've been doing lately is <clears throat> looking up spells in the uh just one at a time and i'm starting with cantrips because they can be pretty amazing you can cast them over and over again and no spell slot or anything like that like shape water is one cantrip and it allows you to uh, freeze water or move water up to five feet. So if you have a cubic five feet of water and you suspend that from the ceiling frozen and then, you know, you drop it on somebody, that's over 7,000 pounds being dropped on this on top of somebody. That's a creative use. Or if you have a, if you've dig in, if you've dug a pit trap and you've put a bunch of spikes in the bottom of it, you can cover it over with ice and have you know your other spellcaster melt the ice when the guys are coming across it, or it lets you get across a, a, a pit of of that stuff. Or more creatively, you can change the water color to whatever you want. So if you have a barbarian and you got a bunch of guys breaking into a room, you just, you know, throw a bunch of water on, on the ground, change it to red. And then when they come in, they got this crazy barbarian with the entire room splattered with blood from their perspective. So, I mean, there's a lot of creative uses for it that I think, I think about a lot. And I've been working towards just learning more about it to come up with creative ways to approach spell casting. And that would be something our listeners could 
could start to do. They could start approaching spellcasting from this creative side by going to resources online. And there's a lot of resources out there for it. Maybe not a lot, but several. I mean, there's definitely a lot of Reddit threads, some of which are gauged towards specific spells. And then there's a there's a forum that's pretty popular called Giants in the Playground. That's another great place you can go where they have individual threads for cantrips in particular is the ones I've been focused on lately. You can go down through those different cantrips and have people talk about what works, what doesn't work, and even stuff from a game master's perspective where game masters will weigh in and say, well, you can't do it by the letter of the rules, but... I allow it because it creates more creative and fun play for my players. And again, back to what Mara was saying, Stephen was saying, if you deviate too far from the rules, it's the degree to which you deviate from the rules from the game master side that you run greater risk of making the game less fun because you're going to be breaking game mechanics that cause it less fun for the players like maybe thieves, for example, if you have a thief in the party, but then you've got a wizard who's using shape water to freeze out locks, then you diminish that the usefulness of the thief. So you're going to have to address that in some way. And there are different ways you could address it, one of which would be just to disallow that use. So back to the original question. Lately, I've been going the Mara route and just thinking more creatively about how you would use spells, because I think it's fun and it can create for some very... It, it can allow you to create some very memorable moments in your, your games. I, I just want to say really quickly on one that just that one little thing about the lock thing. Mm-hmm. As a person who likes to play rogues more often now, what I would do as a GM, if I was having an issue with a annoying magic user who was freezing the locks and the, Steven? the rogue in the party wasn't able to do anything, <laughs> and I'd say, oh, it just happens that the... The lock is very well greased up, lubricated, so and it takes a while for the for this to change. There's enough time that as it's turning to ice, it actually just the water just slips out, it, you know, slips out of the lock. And there, I mean, there's ways you can kind of control, you know, the player's more well, nasty tendencies. To your this. wizard has an it's- aneurysm. <laughs> <laughs> it's no it, it's no different than a knock spell though that's already in the rules so what's what i mean why would a magic user want to you know well, blow his spell is. for the day you know what i'm saying why would you want to blow your spell for the day whenever you got a guy that can do it without you know costing any magic points or whatever well i think this one is actually a cantrip so you're not right. actually blowing the spell this is, oh, this you is use it as much as one cast 300 times Nothing. No Acid cost, splash. No slots, nothing. Acid splash. Another cantrip that you can cast over and over and over again. And Steve and I, uh, Stephen and I, talked about this. You could cast it on a lock and burn out the lock with the acid splash. But Stephen, that of course, would take a while. It would. It might take a while. Yeah. But Stephen had a more creative use of acid splash of disposing a body. So he would just put the body in a tub and you cast acid splash over and over again to get rid of the evidence. Which also now that's an awful lot of work. When, but if then you, you have, have to shovel. carry around a tub, right. who wants for to carry reason, around a tub? Well, I mean, really I think it's situational. For some reason, uh, it's, I don't know. Yeah, situational. You know, if you happen to tub. be right, if you happen to be in a cabin in the woods with a tub. Your Call of Cthulhu t- <laughs> uh, cabin in the woods with a tub. You can use your acid splash spell to take care of the body, so the cops don't get that, you. Uh, yeah, that that disturbs me on so many levels right now. So, rest of the party <laughs> roll for sanity. <laughs> so, I I was thinking about something when Jimmy was talking about using spells, and I I realized that a lot of the ways that Jimmy looks at approaching a spell in a creative way is a little different than mine because mine is usually you don't say you d- well, no <laughs> no i mean so so mine are kind of uh, bizarre <laughs> they're one trick ponies they're they're situational to to me it's like I'm in the kitchen. I need a spatula. I have a spatula. Great. I have, I have all these different tools that have one particular use. I don't have a lot of multi-use tools. What you're talking about using 
creating water, coloring it like blood, and setting off your barbarian is a more creative use of a spell in kind of the greater context of gaming than I think mine are. You don't think so? Well, all right. So here's what I'll say about that. Um, And I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole, but I think that what you did prior to discovering Magic the Gathering is different than what you do now. Hmm. The way that you approach spells reminds me of the way that you play Magic. In that I'm going to take this, which stacks on that, which means this, therefore that, and therefore this, and the, then the effect would be blah. And you go, okay. Because it effectively magic is a handful of one-trick ponies, right? More or less. Right. You know, you know, just cards that do something like that. The way you approach spellcasting before that was closer to what you're saying that Jimmy's doing, which is, I'm going to call it creative interpretation of the boundary of the rule. Fair. So the way Jimmy approaches, the uh, way he just talked about spellcasting reminds me a lot of when we used to play strategy board games like Axis and Allies and things like that. He would look at the rules and he would say, this is what the rules say. Therefore, this is the place where the rules fail. And that gives me a breach in or a place where the rules simply don't cover an activity. It reminds I'm not saying exactly like that. I'm just saying that it reminds me of that. That's how you tend to approach the spell casting now. That's fair. Slightly different. I mean, I, that's why I think the Lego analogy works in the way that Steven approaches it. I have a bunch of Legos and they all have immutable properties, but combined, they make an interesting bit of, of creativity where I don't think that that works as well in, in Jimmy's case. You hear that, Jimmy? I'm Voltron. <laughs> <laughs> so, nerd. Th- that, that's just my observations. But let, let's bump over to um, Steve-O, who's been relatively quiet in this whole thing. And I think part of it is because he hasn't played a lot of D&D in the last more years than he probably wants to admit. <laughs> but Because he's been playing for a while. And you certainly... To, I've never run a D&D style or fantasy style campaign that you, I was never played in a fantasy campaign that you have run personally. And the only person I think that has is John when we were much younger. So looking at this somewhat of as an outsider, what do you think about this creative spell casting? How, what is it as a DM? Does it rub you like, Oh no wait, but that's not, I don't like that at all. Or that's interesting. I think we should play with that more or somewhere in between being, I don't. I don't run a lot of fantasy games. It's not my thing, really. Of course, we're doing Call of Cthulhu, which has a little bit of magic in it. And I know the next chapter when we resume this, you guys are actually going to have access to some magic spells, which you didn't in the first book or first, you know, part of this. So you guys will have some time to study these spells. So it will be interesting to to take that up. There's not a ton of magic in Call of Cthulhu. Certainly not like a fantasy game such as Dungeons and Dragons, but. Um, if it were me and I was playing Dungeons and Dragons, which is pretty rule heavy and somebody approached me with said, I want to try and do this spell. I would certainly refer, refer to make sure that it would fit within the rules because a rule heavy system such as Dungeons and Dragons, if we all adhere to the rules, then it feels more fair to the players. And, you know, I'm, I mean, I would allow it. I would certainly listen to it, it but it, it would have to fit in the rules. I wouldn't let somebody cast, for instance, two spells in one turn unless it was a bonus action and a spell, something like that. You know, but I, but I would certainly listen to it. I mean, if it was creative, I mean, the whole point of playing is for everyone to have fun. If, if a spellcaster came up with a really creative way to use a spell and it fit within the rules, then absolutely. Might have unexpected results in one of my games, but you never know. <laughs> what do you mean, might? <laughs> yeah. It well. will have unexpected results. <laughs> yeah. Jim, you're dead again. <laughs> Go make another <laughs> character. That's not unexpected. No, no, no. He said, he, he said That's unexpected. That's not unexpected. It's <laughs> oh, <point>. true. <laughs> That's exactly what we expect to happen. You're still alive, Jim. Woo! There's a reason all your characters are named Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> they killed Kenny, but, you bastards. 
I think, you know, for instance, I've, I mean, I've been playing with Steve and uh, and we've all been pretty creative in this homebrew system because the rules allow it. And Frank, you've pretty much had to be the judge to say yes or no whenever we come up with, with a crazy idea for a spell. And it's kind of caught on. You know, I enjoy it. It's like anything I can think of, I can maybe cast that spell and then you, you say yes or no, whether we can do it or not within a turn or, or what have you. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, I like it. Um, I don't know that I would want to run a fantasy game, just a lot of rules. So, so when you're talking about, you know, fun, cause everyone's playing on the same rules, uh, which is just an opinion that, that Jimmy, I know has expressed in many games, many times. That's sort of his philosophy as well. Um, so let me ask you this, let's just background. So we've been doing this, this homebrew and John, uh, with some input from me set down to create a spell system that was specifically catered to Steven's predilections towards creativity and spellcasting. So the idea behind this is that spells are sort of born out of, I'm going to call rudimentary ooze. So you've got mana, you've got some rough structure. And after that, go nuts, do what you want. It's up to you. What you can think of, you can do if you can describe it. Uh, and that is, almost the antithesis of like a D list of all the possible ramifications you can do with spells and things like that. And from a game master's perspective, I found it to be a mixed bag, but certainly this is the, f- I think this is the first time we've really tried doing this. Uh, so it is a first play test through, but from a player's perspective, how have you guys, I mean, Steve just, Steve just said that he you know has enjoyed it, but how have you found that to be particularly with things like, fairness and equity of of rules. I'll tell you as the kind of overall creator of this system, I I see a lot of things that really need to be addressed, both in how mana is like, I I think for one thing, the mana is at least the way we've got it set up now seems that the mana costs seem to be high. I kind of like the idea of cantrip kind of spells, ones that are very cheap or very, or either free, maybe like light or something very simple like that. But it also might be something that it that ends up being based on your ability, lack of a better word, your level, but your skill. Your skill that, level, yeah. Right, would would define whether something became more cantropy, i.e. free or, you know, low cost or whatever. But also in hand how to handle stuff like one of the things that I noticed that one thing that Stephen had done a few times was he paralyzed just a an appendage of an enemy, <laughs> and um, he did that a couple of times, and it and it worked to need effect. The nice thing about it is it's not an overarching kind of thing. You're not paralyzing the you know the the target entirely, but you maybe just paralyze a leg and then. They fall, which, of course, I mean, you can have damage taken just from the tumble itself. They go over a ravine, any number of things. Their effectiveness in battle is severely reduced. There's there's a number of things that you can kind of take with that. And in terms of a spell, and in terms of, like, in combat and the overarching kind of spiel with that, that, that really, the way I see that, that shouldn't cost a lot of mana to do. It should be fairly quick and easy to cast as a, a caster. And, and the nice thing is it actually makes a caster an asset. I mean, the fact that you could have a caster do things, you know, like paralyze the, the shield arm, let's say, of, of the big bad that you're trying to kill, something like that. Well, now he can't defend as well. You'll be able to, you know, your fighters will actually have a better chance against him if he's some uber powered you know boss that, that you got them uh, fighting against you know it, it's it, to me it's kind of similar to being able to you know if you've got like uh, large groups of kobolds like in D&D we, we've been having that with uh, the game we've been playing lately with Andrew where we've had kind of these large groups and they're kind of difficult to take out because of the ability they have or be able to rush in attack and jump away goblins right I hate goblins so the, the idea of being able to use something like Grease so that it makes it difficult for them to move in, do this attack or something like that. But it also then makes it difficult for the players to be able to attack them because you've got this Grease that your own characters are trying to get in. But this ability where Steven has been paralyzing just like their legs 
or a leg or something like that. You know, it's, it's a very tactically advantageous spell. It's not very costly. It helps get the job done, but it doesn't completely rule out the fighters. Like we were talking about earlier with using like ice and a lock to completely get rid of your rogue. Well, the rogue doesn't, you don't need a rogue now because you don't need someone to pick locks. Well, this is kind of a similar thing. If the, if the, uh, magic user is so powerful that you don't need fighters anymore, then again, it's like, well, it's just a one player game then. And so I guess the way I'm seeing it is that this very, uh, interesting use, we'll say, of spells for this, these tactical advantages really can make a big difference in, in playability, I think. Well, well, one thing for me, when I made the comment that things need to fit within the rules, is the reason you have rules is why everyone is a fifth or sixth level character playing together, and you don't have one guy that's level 25 playing with a guy that's first level and a guy that's you know fifth level and another guy that's tenth, because the group has to sort of have their abilities within their specialty. But if you allow break the rules and allow a spellcaster to chain a bunch of spells or do something really outside of the rules, then what why why can't a fighter say, Well, I wanna hit him with my sword, but I wanna do a sweep kick and knock him off his feet at the same time. I mean, what's the difference, right? I mean, these are actions that aren't allowed in the rules. And there's a reason for that, because everybody has to sort of be balanced, have their strengths at at whatever level they are to not make it too easy, right? You don't want it to be too easy. Don't want to be too hard either. It's all about balance and having fun. There'd be a challenge, but be able to overcome the challenge. But, you know, of course, you know, that's just up to the game master to decide that if a, a creative use of a spell can be done or not. And again, that's why I think having maybe an unforeseen circumstance to be creative with the result sometimes could help, you know, balance things. So what about you, Jim? I was, I was drifting off there a little bit. Um, what specifically about <laughs> what? <laughs> Damn dude. It's like every episode. Man. Yeah. <laughs> it's I, I was, so yeah, go ahead. The, the, this, this creative use of spell casting, how are you finding it? You know, in, in John's of- game. Yeah. Um, in John's game, I'm with John on the mana cost, and I've been thinking a lot about it when we haven't been playing, just on the side from time to time. Have you, though? I have. <laughs> and here's what I came <laughs> away with. So so Dungeons & Dragons is what they call Vancean magic. It's uh, after Jack Vance's uh, Dying Worlds. I think that was the name of the, the novel. I think several novels, probably. And that's what the original first edition of Dungeons and Dragons sort of based the magic system off of. And the idea was that you would have distinct spells that were like spell bombs where you would cast them once and then you're done. So it sort of constrained what a user could do or what a uh, player could do in a game and allowed for some good game mechanics to find that balance uh, Steve was talking about. Now, with John, he's gone the whole other end of the spectrum to a large degree where you can do anything you want. The main constraint in the game mechanics there is the mana that you can utilize. So finding that balance... We'll call this the Eddings system. There you go. (laughs) After Mr. David Eddings of the Pawn of Prophecy and whatever the second trilogy was, was, which was basically a rewrite of the first trilogy. He's just making more money. Selling the same books. Actually, it wasn't a trilogy. It was five books, but that's neither here nor there. Yeah. Um, the Will and the Word, by the way. The Will and the Word was the- Will and the Word. Base concept. I read those. Yeah. They're pretty good books for, you know, a 14-year-old. So back to what I was trying to- wait, See, you distracted me, and I'm easily distracted. So the game mechanics for John's <laughs> system is really what constrains the user. And finding that balance- Or the uh, player. So finding that balance- is going to be determining how those mana points are being utilized, and we're still working through that. But on top of that, I was thinking I would get with John and talk to him about there being a cost if you're doing a spell on the fly versus uh, a benefit, a lower cost, if you go to the Game Master and say, this is a spell I've created, I've put it in my spell book, 
I'm getting a thumbs up from John right now. We had a conversation about this uh, yeah. back when we were setting this out, and that is actually part of the mechanics. But right. the particular game that we're playing, it we doesn't exactly that. work that right. way. We yeah. don't have that. So we're still working through those things. But I think that is the right direction to go. I still think Steve is right in that you need a really – I don't know that this is going to be for new players. Uh, you really need to have no. uh, a little bit of experience when you go to play the system, but I think it's going to be a really good one. And once John wraps us up and gets it finished, I think we're actually talking about publishing it and maybe we'll give some free copies away to some of our listeners, or maybe we'll just give it away for free. Maybe John's uh, not, not a capitalist and he just wants to be an altruistic, Okay, maybe not. <laughs> I'm getting, I'm getting that. Uh, I, actually, I, I don't know. I, I've thought about that. I've, I've kind of seen it from both, both sides. So. Right, but it, it, I think it's a new. I have not seen another system do this. That's not to say there's not one out there somewhere because right. there are creative uh, spell systems out there, like Call of Cthulhu, which is different from Dungeons and Dragons. And Stevo has a bit more of experience with that. And I think there's a cost to sanity, so it's not like. You get to do magic in Call of Cthulhu without some kind of downside. And there's other systems out there like uh, there's one. Not always. That That's not true. Not always. Sometimes. Sometimes. If it's a really big spell. Right. But that's always. another mechanic to the game that that's interesting. Yeah, true. And there's other games out there like uh, I think there's one, uh, the Five Rings or something like that. That's another one that has some interesting things. I was reading about it. And uh, I think that's a game we might play here before too long. It seemed like it had some pretty interesting things, particularly for Mara. So Yes. It's all about Mara. It's all about playing a game for Mara. <laughs> well, we're gonna do Traveler so, for wait, you, man. <laughs> hold on a second. So let's let's jump over again and put that question towards Steve, because this system was envisioned and constructed specifically to fall into your predilections. And so, you know, the the one metric of success or lack thereof is is your opinion of it i'm listening to every word that comes out of your mouth Stephen. so make it good <laughs> i plead the fifth <laughs> i'm not saying anything I'm not saying anything positive negative doesn't matter so i really like it and i can see where it needs refining on the scalability of what you're trying to accomplish and how either difficult it is, how large of an effect it is, how destructive or restorative, uh, all of those bits that need scaling. That's just something, you know, we're figuring out. But one of the things that always bugged me about Dungeons and Dragons spellcasting is is this limit and and it's it's etched. So you finally get to be a level high enough that you can cast fireball. Well, it's X D6. And whenever you go up a level, you get another D6, for instance. So as you level, there is this baked in scaling of the power of something that still costs the same that it did before. But I guess the, the explanation is that because you become more of a master and you grow in power as a magical being, your spell is more powerful. But what if I want to use a fireball that explodes, you know, the size of a house but does absolutely no real damage. Uh, Jimmy had mentioned this about using a fireball as a signal flare or something like that. So there's no way for me to effectively scale a spell, even though I'm more proficient in magic. I can bump a spell to a higher slot to make it more powerful, but I can't degrade a spell to make it less effective for another use. It, it often, oftentimes when D&D, &D, they'll use a different spell to get that sort of effect. So like you get something like Flame Tongue, which is slightly different, but it's less effective. And that's been their approach, which I think is, I agree with you that that doesn't really work, but yeah. that's what they're trying to do. Yeah. So I, I always, 
like the thought of a of a points based system in some way, where you had this ability to mold your spell in power and duration and Jimmy's chuckling. <laughs> I was reading something on Reddit right before the show, you know, prepping. And it, exactly this thing came up that Prank was talking about where a guy was saying, yeah, you can't do, you can't lower the levels um, with fireball. Like if I wanted to light a cigarette with fireball, I'd end up killing the person. So I'd have to use a whole different spell for that. Yeah. So there's other people with thinking along the same lines as us. Yeah. Well, maybe it's a physics thing. Maybe it's a physics thing that you can't, in order to create the entire fireball. Take a lot of energy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, there's a minimum amount that you have to make it minimally powerful in order to create this specific ball. And it's fire. a great way to uh, take care of your smoking habit <laughs> if you have your cigarette lit <laughs> by fireball. Yeah, typically if you burn your face off, you don't want to smoke anymore. <laughs> or your lungs, you know. But but to that point, I mean, it does it makes it difficult to apply creativity to something like fireball, where if you wanted to have a trap that had fireball in it. I mean, there's mechanisms in the game to allow for that, but it's it gets convoluted and weird to speak to Steven's point. Is that you could do things, but it shouldn't be as hard as it really is if you think about it. I, I'll tell you, man. I think Dungeons and Dragons has been around so long that you can find a spell and it may be above your level. You can typically find just about any spell to do just about anything if you look hard enough. I think. I mean, they the game has been around so long. You don't think so, Jimmy? Absolutely not. I, I don't think so. There's a, a very specific, unique uses that... Um, well, it depends, too. It depends on your game master and the degree to which you're willing to break the game mechanics for a particular spell. Yeah, I think that's probably true. Like, if I wanted to create a, a, a circle of fire, going back to that example, not a spell in there that can do it that I'm aware of. But if the Game Master allows you to change Wall of Fire to the point where you can shape it in any shape you want, you know, I want to shape it into this weird polygon shape, then, and the Game Master's like, sure, then sure, you could do it. But as the rules are written, there's a lot of gaps. I, I think Steve may have been talking about, like, you know, if you go through all the extended rules, and, that, and he might be even talking about all of the additional rules that people write for modules that they do. And Dragon, like Magazine, Dragon Magazine, Unearth, and everything else. Underearth Arcana, and then the Underearth, Underearth Arcana, and then the Underearth, Underearth Arcana that was Underearth, yeah, all that. <laughs> There's probably an extra 200, you know, spells or more, you know, in all the different, you know, rule of pen, you know, compendiums and everything else that have been published over the. 50 years or whatever, um, but, 40 years. Whatever. So let's go back. To, I interrupted Stephen. He was making a point. He was building towards a point. I'm sorry about that. So go, if you can get back to your train of thought there of the, the system that we've been running with the homebrew. Any system that allows you to use a pool of ability in order to steal from it to create an effect can give you a lot greater creativity within the game and a much more varied possibility of effects on the game. It's both very rewarding for an experienced player who's trying to do things within the game that are both reasonable and effective, but it could be very difficult for the DM if you're playing with inexperienced people who are trying to go hog wild and throwing crazy things out that you trying to do things that you as a DM have to make that immediate decision on whether it scales to either their experience or the context of the game or the situation. So, I love the way the magic system is shaping up, to, you know, what it's shaping up to be, but there's a lot of onus on the DM to make it effective as well. So it's a partnership in that regard. In Dungeons and Dragons, as a DM, if you go by the letter of the law, then, you know, there's quite a bit of creativity that's possible within the game if you play it more casual that you never get to. 
and it and I think that because things are so spelled out in Dungeons and Dragons, it makes it difficult for people to look at it and think outside the box. You've got enlarge and reduce. So what happens if, you know, I'm crawling through I'm crawling through a narrow passage and I've got this guy who's squeezing through behind me and he's going to absolutely twist me in two if he catches me. Well, what if I'm able to cast enlarge on him? He won't go <laughs> past the confines, right? But he grows to fill the space. So suddenly I've got a bad guy plug in the cave. So, and <laughs> if you reverse that, and, and enlarge and reduce are weird because enlarge, you will only enlarge to fill the space. So you won't go past it. You will fill the space. You'll plug it. On reduce, so if I reduce somebody, let's say the halfling gets on my nerves or a gnome and I reduce them. Wait, wait, wait. I'm not, I'm not saying Hold that for any particular reason. Hold on a minute. Why are you picking reason. on the yeah. short yeah, people yeah. here, man? What's up? I'm I'm just saying for for matter of example this is easier humans I swear. typical human yep yep I'm with you I know but if I take say a small creature and reduce it to to tiny or whatever and then because I don't like it I put it in a box and then the spell wears off and that box is a tiny box Reduce has no entry in the player's handbook that says, well, if you can't expand past the confines, you remain that size. It just says you return to your normal size. So that was a very bad sound effect to try and do. I'm really reading this as a threat, Stephen. Read it as you will. As the gnome of the game. <laughs> so as feeling threatened. Right. So you have to you have to know you have to know the text of the spell and the spells are so restrictive that most people just read them as that and they don't think about the changing a liquid's color to red to incite a barbarian or reducing something to a tiny size and putting it in a tiny box and then letting it expand and expire within the confines of said box. It sounds really way more awful saying it out loud than the way I thought <laughs> about it. It's pretty awful. It's uh, yeah, yeah. So um, sounded better in your mind, right? Yeah, it sounded. Yeah, Steve was the halfling, and me as the gnome are not appreciating that line of thought. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was just trying I to remember think. that Monday night on our what? next session. That's right. We'll wait till he's asleep, <laughs> and then we'll put the pillow over his face. See, you just can't be trusted. Close your eyes and breathe <laughs> deeply. Let me we just no say, pillows. as the GM, you have no pillows. Right. I'm going to make some pillows. <laughs> I'll use this towel. Yeah, you're not going. You're not going to get my towel. Going to get some poison so we'll ivy so in a sack. We'll just conjure some pillows. <laughs> conjure some pillows. <laughs> some three-legged pillows. <laughs> <laughs> so let me just say, from a game master standpoint, I simultaneously rather enjoy the system because I do uh, like the creativity it allows my players, and I absolutely hate the system because. It is so fluid and so malleable that it's a real challenge to respond in a consistent and meaningful way. Mm -hmm. Particularly if you've got clever players. Well, can I do this but do that? How does that impact the mana points? Am I using too many mana points when I'm estimating what the spell is going to cost? Am I using too few? Am I using the same rule set that I applied a week earlier when a spell that was cast like this, why is that suddenly more mana points than the one that they're talking about now? It becomes, well, it, 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 the only way I know to fix it is to come up with essentially what James has complained about with John's system in the past is multivariate calculus that you have to do on the fly to sort of calculate out. And, and on top of that, you've got to do all that whilst running all the other elements of a game. And it becomes a challenge and is going to break at any point. So that's been a very, it's, I, I kind of dislike that, which I think more speaks more to development of the system and play testing. Yeah. Yeah. I have some thoughts on that front that I'm going to talk to John about that. I think will take that 
calculus out of the regular gameplay. Well, you know, you should, I, in fairness, you should talk to all of us because, you know, having run it, I can have some input there. Oh, for sure. But I want to run it through John first to see if I'm missing something before wasting okay. your time. One thing uh, I would like to see is somehow the mana should be variable for everyone. For instance, someone that's more oriented toward spell casting, maybe it should be tied to intelligence or depending on the type. Of, I know we have four different schools of spell casting, maybe, maybe two tied to whatever the equivalent of wisdom is in the game. I don't remember, but that, that would make a little more sense and, and fighting skills tied more to strength and dexterity, things like that. Um, you know, because we all started with the same amount of mana. Now the amount of mana feels about right for a first, I'm assuming first or second level character because, um, you know, we were able to cast several spells and then we're out. So they did, they didn't feel wrong as far as the amount. I just feel that maybe it should be tied to something else that I'm more of a spell caster. So I have more spell points. I'm more of a fighter. I have less. So I don't know. Just a thought. Well, I mean, sort of part of the history of this was um, it was constructed and written down and developed in speed. There was a, from for me at least, there was a big push to be done by, we're going to play Monday. Okay, so I got to get down these rules and deal with a whole nother set of rules that, that we wrote about um, instead of buying your character at the beginning like you normally is that you sort of discover your character. Uh, and that, that's mm-hmm. been its own interesting bit. Uh, and in a mixed experiment from my perspective, but we're playing on Monday. Let's write the rules on Sunday. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's been a bit of that type of thing going on. And, and reality is that I had envisioned the stat called extraordinary points. I called it that. I don't like the name, but it's the only thing I could come up. With. I got a name for it. Meh points, whatever oh. uh, I had uh, um, Jimmy's, hated point total that that's <laughs> whatever you call stat you want to call it um i envisioned that that anyone could use and that would function as fan as mana so uh it would make more sense that everybody has the same pool because you use it for a lot of different things under that context of what i had been thinking but the way that john envisioned it was mana and he i don't think he i don't think i communicated what i would was thinking very well and we never ever talked about okay, what else would you use it for, uh, type of thing. So there was a lot of problems with that implementation to get it written and out the door. Uh, so there's a lot of that bit that I think would change. Now there's no such thing as level in this game. So the idea that you'll grow, Stevo, in level isn't really part of a thing per se. So there's a whole lot of issues with this system, but it's again, it's it's not even a beta it's a thought let's see how this works it's an omega i don't know it's 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 just a a place to begin to have a, a, a implementation i think it needs a lot of tweaking and, and and while there actually is rules for preparing spells that cost less mana points it's just that you've never had in the game so far you haven't had a moment you could sit down and prepare spells so but it's been a good that, way to run it because it's given me a lot of ideas and and uh things that we can address with the game mechanics that I imagine John's probably already thought of, but I just want to run and buy him to make sure. I have a lot of these rules actually written down somewhere, and I thought I had them. He says this. I, I he th- says I this. I thought I had this as, <laughs> as electronic documents, but I am pretty sure now that I actually have it written down in a notebook. It's probably in that and box right what's... behind your left shoulder, right there, under the... <laughs> 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 the, that box? Uh, yeah, think, that, wait, that box. box. I'm pretty certain that, maybe it's the one in the floor over to the right. <laughs> okay. Blue spiral bound that I have that actually had most of the spell rules in it. <laughs> Your room looks like an Amazon warehouse. <laughs> That's You've been ordering That's a lot funny. of stuff. Yeah. Oh yes. Oh dear God, yes. <laughs> So, yeah. You know, as as so anyway, all. he's all right. So you've got this all written down. Clint, so anyway, I have quite a bit of the stuff written down. Um, so if I can find it, like like so, some of the stuff in there is also like like the damage level is based on on how how high your skill is as well. So there's a number of like restrictions based on your you know your actual ability. I mean, and that's I think I think that's really kind of a, a point. Because we've been really talking about my system, and I, I don't think people really care too much about it. But the you're right. Shut up. The, well, the, <laughs> no, no. Well, my, my point is this though: is that 
the reason that D and D is chock full of just a you know encyclopedia of rules, and you have a very limited little scope of your spell, is because to make it malleable, to make it more you know um, uh, robust, uh, robust, yeah, um, and engaging requires adding a lot of rules. And so, like, just for one spell entry in the player's handbook, you know, like, like let's say that you did the, this thing for, for Fireball. You know, it's, it's probably like three sentences in the original, you know, player's handbook for AD&D. But if you used to add some stuff in and go, well, if you want to make it so that the Fireball is, you know, three times larger, then you can reduce the damage by you know, three or blah, 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 you know, and you could add a bunch of math into it. And really, you know, D&D in no way is math heavy. It's not made for that sort of thing and, and not made for characters to do that, really. Um, players, GMs, anybody. It, it was never kind of made with that intent. And so it was just a way to go, this is what happens when you cast the spell. And to try and ad hoc add some little modifiability, malleability, however you want to say it, to each individual spell would become, I mean, the, the, the player's handbook would, would be about the size of just a spell section would be War and Peace. And, and, and that'd be like for first level spells. I mean, it'd be just, it'd be really unplayable. It, it don't, I mean, you never get through this stuff just to do it. And then, of course, the problem you have is that especially, you know, newbie players or even people that have only been playing for a year or two would probably just be overwhelmed with this. What is all this stuff? There's just there's just too much to... I just want to cast a spell that does so-and-so. And so I think that's what they did. They tried to hit most all the possibilities. Like, well, here's light. Here's magic missile. Here's fireball. These are... And, and everything is kind of engraved in stone. And, and maybe there's a couple little things that you can, you know, modify on a few spells over the entire, you know, book of spells. And that's it. It's, it's very simple. You have very little, um, changes that you can make to that. And I think it's part of it is just for playability. I think really when it comes down to it, for, for most GMs would, would have a tough time handling all the different possibilities that someone, if they were creative, could come up with. And then on the other hand, players would just be overwhelmed by how to even get through the rule set to find out what they could or couldn't do. Or And then you, you might hit, hit boundaries and go, well, what if I wanted to do it like so-and-so? Well, that's just, that's just you know, we'll a, call that- a tenth of a step too far. You we'll know. call that the Stephen rule. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the Stephen uh, boundary. Right. So, all right. So I, I do want to cover one last little point for everybody um, that actually gets beyond spells, creative spell casting. And, and I'm kind of curious, do you think this holds, this can be extended to include non-spell casting things? So my experience talking to or playing with people is when they tend to swing the sword, they go, I'm just going to swing my sword. I'm just going to swing my sword. And reality is, is that I think there's a lot of creativity that you can do in even the martial arts side of things that isn't necessarily spell casting. And for Steven and Jimmy in particular, do you, do you think that uh, you gravitate towards spell casting because it seems to have more opportunity for creativity? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So you don't see the creativity in the, in the martial side of thing that doesn't, is, there, is it the rules that keep you from seeing it, or you just it's not terribly – you don't think it matters? Um, It doesn't, but – Look, let's be honest. With magic, you can do just about anything, particularly in John's system. You can do anything. With a sword, you're pretty limited unless you introduce magic into the combat. There's only so many ways to swing a sword or throw a sword or, you know, maybe combine another weapon with the sword or uh, – an unarmed attack with a sword, you like put a your leg bow sweep, or a sword together, and you throw them. But I will say, <laughs> having played the monk in our Dungeons and Dragons game, now the monk is really interesting because it's almost like you're introducing spells into the martial combats 
And that's pretty interesting. Um, using key points to do things like stunning uh, your opponents or disengaging from them so you don't get attacked or uh, hitting them four times instead of just one or two as a regular attack. Uh, that's pretty interesting. So I, I do know there's more room to take the martial combats in that direction of the way John's doing spell casting, or even the way Dungeons and Dragons does spell casting. They've certainly done that with the uh, monk. I never address this much in my system at all. I, I really want to, but the the attitude I always had was um, I wanted a system that let you kind of role play like you were the main character in a movie. That was that was always the way I envisioned this. I want it to be so that you got to your your Indiana Jones. You got to do the really crazy thing with the whip or whatever nut job thing you could come up with. You could do it. That you know the character had that you know if, if there was a way to get out of you know getting hit by the boulder, he just you know he swung his whip and swung across the thing and he, he made it out or whoever I mean any number of things that's the way I envisioned it is that the players are cinematic it's a movie cinematic experience is what I always wanted for players and so spells kind of encompass that in terms of they can do some neat things you can do something imaginative and, and vast and I would love to do something similar in terms of martial the simple melee where you can, you know, well, uh, you know, as I attack him, I'm also going to kick sand in his face and do little things like that where you can modify your, your attacks in these special ways that can have far reaching or even no effect at all, you know, depending on how well you do, of course, but not be it, not get it where it's so, it's so heavy that the, game grinds to a halt. I mean, that that's one of the issues you also have is that, well, all right, Steven's going to do some spell. Okay, well, you know, I'm going to check my phone and see what the weather is like today. <laughs> <laughs> Any number of, I mean, seriously, you get to a point where, and it's the same thing we could get to this. is like, oh, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to duel with this guy. And so now Steven's in there checking his, you know, weather app and checking Facebook or whatever because, now Jimmy is in a sword duel with with the big bad guy, and everybody just stands and watches. And I mean, in 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 one respect, it's fun, it's cinematic. You kind of get that. But if you get too bogged down with too much detail, um, uh, too much cinematic scope, as it were, uh, then it can, I think, get overwhelming and, and bog the game down to the point that you're just trudging through quicksand, and it's just like. Are we gonna quit yet? I'm kind of done. Or are we gonna order pizza yet? Or anything like that? And 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 only one or two people are having fun. So it's one of these things to try and you want to make it so it's you know it's, it's engaging for everyone, but not too overwhelming. Steve, Stephen, your thoughts quickly. There you go. I, I can't say anything because quickly is. <laughs> not in well, his real house. It's a relative scale. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, Jimmy and I are both making faces like this is not going to happen. This show's going to go on for another forty-five minutes. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. I, I've been sitting here while we've been talking and thinking about the spells again and the use of them and using them creatively. As a spellcaster, it doesn't matter if you're a druid, if you're a cleric, if you're a wizard. It doesn't matter. You can always find a creative use for something. For instance, druid. You've got druid craft now, so you can like sprout a seed and, you know, little little bitty druidy things. Well, you know, you carry a pocket full of seeds, you need to jam up a door so nobody can break the lock, you put a seed in the keyhole and you sprout it. Maybe cast plant growth on it or something like that. Have it gum up the entire mechanism. Nobody gets through the door. Unless, of course, they try to break it down. But if you do the plant growth right, you know, that helps with that. There, there are all kinds of little things you can do with these seemingly mundane spells. Hey, Jimmy. Yeah, uh, John, stop typing. Sorry, I had an idea and I had to get it down because I will forget it otherwise. 
Use a pencil. I don't have a pencil. <laughs> the 21st century, man. Come on, get real. Fine, I'll just cut myself and use the blood. Jesus. <laughs> and that's how you get creative spellcasting. <laughs> that's call a Cthulhu note taking right there. <laughs> Boys and girls, please do not try this at home. Put away your X-Acto knives and your quill pens. So I saw something really cool in another thread where someone said they used the spell sleep to go fishing. So I look at it as the old guys who used to throw a stick of dynamite in the reservoir to kill all the fish and they'd float to the top. So this guy was casting sleep on a large volume area of water i don't think they don't understand there that fish don't float to the top when they sleep it was a neat idea it's a neat idea but it, it's incorrect so they float to the top when you blow them up with dynamite <laughs> they do that yes they do so the difference is when you're dead you float to the top when you sleep you don't <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I believe that would be an interesting thing to see. If if a fish goes to sleep magically. Does it drown? Will it still maintain? I mean, because no, the it shouldn't. Well, it I mean, shouldn't. the movement is what allows the, the gills yeah. to work properly. So if it's asleep <laughs> and stops moving. <laughs> see, the way I thought about it was um, you were fishing for piranhas and you cast sleep yeah. on your your bug mate and you were throwing him in the water and then really him back in. Yeah. But that did that did also bring up an interesting way to murder is to cast sleep on somebody and then Coup to de gras. disguise how they died, throw them in the water. Ooh. There you go. So this is not turning out well. I should not talk about <laughs> nefarious use of spells. <laughs> so, it's uh <laughs> okay, so we, we've, we've gone pretty long on this one, uh, and I think that, that it just sort of speaks a bit to the depth and breadth of spell casting and importance and how you can do a lot of different things and, and apply yourself creativity to the, to the endeavor, as it were. As Jimmy said, you could do anything with magic. So it's both exciting because you can and frustrating when you can't. Uh, if you're doing something really interesting with spells or you've got some great example of spell casting, uh, please let us know and send us any information in the contact information coming in a minute. In a minute, 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 in a minute. That's all we have for this week. Thanks for spending time with us. Please leave a review and comments wherever you listen. It helps others find the show. If you have topic suggestions or would like to get in touch, you can reach us at roleplaygeeks at roleplaygeeks.com. Head on over to the website for an archive of all our previous shows, as well as links to all our social media channels. Thanks again, and we'll catch you next week. <laughs>